So I named my son Ryan after Ryan Black, one of my heroes in the consumer electronics space. He uh, worked at Engadget, ran the news teams there. I used to meet him at CES, running around the show floor. Uh, but now we're getting a look at the new gadget site that he's built. It's really the best place to come and, and check out the latest gadgets. Who are you? Uh, so I'm Ryan Block. I'm the co-founder of Gadget. That's uh, gdgt.com. Uh, you might formally remember me as the editor-in-chief of Engadget.com, uh, which is a technology news site uh, that is massive and they do everything and uh, is pretty pretty awesome uh, site. And after that, um, the original Engadget founder, Peter Rojas, and I started Gadget. Um, and we now uh, are in the space not to tell you everything that is uh, happening at the, you know, up to the moment news coverage of consumer electronics and personal technology, but really what's the best stuff? What's the best stuff to buy um, and you know, when's the right time to buy it? So I wanted to split this interview into two pieces. One, I want to know about what, you, what you're uh, shipping right now and what you're doing on the site. And then I want to talk to it more generally about what's happening in the consumer electronics space and what you're seeing happen. But yeah, awesome. So what, what are you announcing today or uh, shipping lately? Well, I mean, we've been doing a lot of stuff on the site lately. Um, the first thing is, you know, Gadget now is uh, a really, is turned into a really great place uh, to go get consumer electronics reviews. And, and a big part of that for us is the Gadget score, which is this aggregate curated score that we put together based on uh, reviews from around the web, uh, reviews from on the site, um, our own conclusions and independent research on this. And uh, we take into account everything from individual criteria for a product. So if it's a camera, you know, we look at battery life and uh, image quality. And if it's a laptop, we look at um, you know, processor speed and uh, features. And so we, we look at everything differently. We look at everything in context. Uh, we uh, put it into an algorithm, but we also hand curate it and do, in, uh, as I said, an independent research on it. Uh, and the result is uh, our gadget score, which is uh, a 1 to 100 score on you know, where the product ranks in the world of consumer electronics. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, less than 1% of the tens of thousands of products that we have in our database are uh, what we call must have. So those are our recommended products. Um, and those are the ones that you know I personally would recommend that you go buy. So if you called me up and said, "Hey Ryan, which you know which camera, which cell phone should I buy?" I'm going to say, you know, you don't even have to ask me. Just go to gadget.com, go to the must-haves page, uh, and that's what I would tell you to buy. And we were just there, and uh, my favorite three phones are there: the right, iPhone, exactly. the Samsung S3, and the HTC One, right? Yeah. So you know, we take a very curatorial uh, approach to this. Um, you know. As I said, we do kind of have humans on the one side who are ingesting all this data from you know, reviews from around the web and, and the humans using the site um, creating review data, user review data. We put all the stuff into an algorithm, but then we also have a research team who looks at the output of that and, and does analysis uh, and then comes to an independent conclusion. So we're taking the best of both worlds, you know, the, the, the best of you know, data and uh, you know, algorithmically generated rankings and the best of human curation. And you know, Peter and I know obviously a ton about consumer electronics. Um, the, the leader of uh, you know, our gadget score process is Mark Purton, who uh, used to work with us at Engadget. He was also the former uh, executive editor of online at Consumer Reports. So you know, we have a lot of experience and pedigree in uh, consumer electronics reviews. Yeah. What, what's going on behind us, by the way? Uh, so we're in our San Francisco office. Uh, so this is where we build everything and design everything. So all of our product is happening here. Um, so everybody behind us is uh, coding, uh, you know, new features for the site, um, and you know, working on design and, and product. Yeah, this is different than when you were in the news business, right? The news Very business, you had to yeah. go to a lot of press conferences and, and work your ass off at CES and stuff like that. But explain how you came to the. Uh, realization that you should do a gadget review site m mostly because you still do some press events to keep your chops up, right? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I haven't fallen off completely. Um, I mean, you know, it's 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 been a, a really interesting last few years. I think the market has changed enormously. Um, you know, when Engadget first started, uh, consumer electronics were still kind of a geeky curiosity, 
and I don't really think that most people uh, saw them as kind of the tools that we use for living. And that was back in 2004, and actually right around the time that uh, Engadget started, that's when consumer electronics really started taking off in the mainstream. And so by 20, you know, 2006, 2008, 2010, everybody had a cell phone and a laptop and a digital camera and an HDTV, and it was just everyone had this technology. And before that, you know, it was actually pretty rare if you had all of those things at the same time. Yeah. The proliferation of all these products created a new issue, which was uh, no longer finding out what's actually coming out because you know, we kind of solved that issue with Engadget. Engadget was, you know, here's everything that's happening in, in the world of consumer tech um, and you know, what you need to know about these products coming out. So that, that problem got solved. Then the problem that we saw starting, <laughs> starting to come up was there's so much stuff. How do you possibly wade through it? Yeah. Uh, you know, Engadget publishes hundreds, sometimes thousands of posts uh, in a week or in a month and it's just an enormous amount of data to wade through, especially if you know, you're just casual, you wanna know what to get. So you know, my tastes have changed and you know, my lifestyle has changed over the years and you know, this is kind of a reflection of that, which is I wanna know, in, you know as quickly as possible uh, what is the absolute best product to get, um, taking into account everything from price and how long it's been on the market and what its competition is and what its features are and what users think of it and critics think of it. Um, taking all that into account and not having to do you know 10 or 15 hours of research to get there and it's it's crazy how many uh, ac accessories are available now I mean I, I just got a new Mophie pack those battery pack I, there's infinite number of cases and accessories do you try to get into that level of the gadget world as well or we're getting there a little bit um, yeah. we haven't done a ton with uh, you know some of the accessories and you know power stuff generally um, our philosophy has been if you plug it into a wall you can put a current through it um, you know that's what we think of as being electronics and that's what we focused on but we're slowly starting to branch out so you know yeah. we've put like the nest on the site and that's not kind of a normal you know what one normally thinks of in consumer electronics but it's amazing and so you know our our uh, umbrella is expanding in, in the consumer electronics space just as the consumer electronics space is coming up with really interesting new product categories now you, you you're not really trying to be a testing lab, are you? Did, did somebody actually buy the Nest and test it out and, and come up with their own opinion? Or did you aggregate opinions from other people in, into that review score? I, explain well, we do both. It. And so it really depends on the products. Um, you know, it's almost impossible to test every product on the market. Um, at any given time, there are thousands and thousands of products. And, you know, our team is 15 people. Um, and, you know, so it, it would be literally impossible for us to, to test every product that was out there by hand um, and then write a review for it. Um, but on the other side, uh, I think if you were to just go out there and scrape the data from all the different sites, you would only get a small fraction of the real valuable information uh, about a product. So yep. we try to combine curation with data and we try to you know, combine uh, our experience in the space uh, and, and think of reviews almost the way we thought of um, news, right? Yeah. So back in the day, uh, before Engadget, before blogs, news was, you know, it was a, a, a thousand word uh, column, you know, in, in a paper, uh, and, you know, it would take maybe two, two editors and, uh, or two, uh, two staff writers and an editor uh, a week to get a piece out. Uh, and then we kind of turned that model on its head by, you know, boiling everything down, making it super accessible, putting it into you know, 200 words or less and uh, publishing in a medium that was very easily digestible. Yeah. So we actually kind of took that same thought process. You know, the specifics are very different, but we took the same thought process behind that and applied it to reviews. So you know, my original review of the iPhone um, in 2007 on a gadget was I think like, like 20,000 words. I mean, yeah. it was enormous, right? And the review of the iPhone 4S on gadget is under 200 words with a bunch of really rich, uh, richly formatted data points. Yeah. Um, so you know, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people uh, to get relevant information. And if you want to dig deeper, you know, we have all of the links and everything that you could possibly need to go out and, and read every review there is. Yeah, I know. Uh, I was just at the Y Combinator demo day, and I saw several hardware products there. I, I, are you sensing that the world is? shifting, um, the world of startups is shifting back to war toward hardware partly because of Kickstarter? And mm -hmm. I guess this is the second part of the interview where we talk a little right. bit more about industry I mean, trends. It's, it's tricky to say. So it's, 
it's still harder to you know uh, build bits than atoms. I mean, uh, atoms than bits. Yeah. Uh, it's still much more challenging to create a hardware product than a software product um, because the considerations are so much greater. Um, you know, software you can ship instantly, and you know with things like the App Store now, it's easier than ever to actually take a platform-specific application and distribute it to a user. Yeah. Um, you know, hardware, you still have to manage, uh, you know, the, the initial design and tooling and part supply chains, shipping. Uh, there's just all these factors that you have to take into account that still make it really difficult. But it's still, it's actually become easier than ever. So, you know, in the world of hardware, although it's still really hard, it's orders of magnitude easier than it was, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, um, and it kind of continues to, uh, to 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 get easier for startups to ship hardware. Yeah, one of the uh, big uh, Chinese supply chains, PCH, just opened a design mm -hmm. shop here in San Francisco, right? Yeah. Are you seeing any, any other trends like that that are shifting how companies can start hardware and that how this is not just going to be the apples and the uh, Microsofts or the Googles and the Panasonics and the Canons and the Nikons, but new companies that we haven't really heard of before, like the Nest? Yeah, well, I think part of it is, um, I mean, the Nest is not, maybe not the best example of a, 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 a you know, small hardware startup because they raised a lot of money and, you know, it's Tony Fidel who, you know, he was the inventor of the iPod, so this is somebody who knows how to run a massively, you know, massively scaled hardware business. But, you know, for some products like Fitbit, they started pretty small and, you know, the Pebble Watch, that was obviously, it came from much more humble beginnings. Yeah. Um, you know, if if you can get a, a few million dollars of funding, you can actually create a hardware product. And that's fundamentally different uh, from, from where we were 10 years ago. Uh, so, you know, the tide has shifted, and if you have an idea for hardware, um, you might actually be able to ship it now. It's just, you know, there's still some really major uh, barriers in between, you know, the concept and getting something out there. Whereas with software, you know, the only barrier is your ability to code. Yeah. In the old days, it was uh, really pretty hard to launch a product that wasn't launched at one of the big consumer electronics shows like CES or IFA. Is that changing? Do, do you sense that Apple really has broken that door down where you, you can launch a product here in San Francisco and get the kind of coverage that you used to have to go to CES for? Well, I think products kind of launch a few different ways now. Um, it used to be pretty, you know, pretty much the same thing each time, which is, you know, get a big, uh, you know, kind of press uh, campaign together and push it out maybe with a trade show. So, you know, it, it, it really, you can kind of fit a hardware launch uh, to the product. Uh, yeah. Which is, you know, that's something that's also changed, and that's that's true of any personal technology product now. It's so much easier to launch something uh, than it was, you know, just a few years ago, just before everyone is on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, it, you cover a lot of the live events, um, like Apple's big events. Yeah. Wh which which events do you choose to uh, go out and cover? I, I have a feeling it's a little bit more of personal enjoyment than it used it's, to be. And that's absolutely what it is. I mean, yeah, I, I won't lie. I, you know, I go and I do live blogs of the Apple events. Um, one because the interest is enormous, and uh, you know, it's it's a great opportunity for us to, you know, show people that we've got this amazing product database with all these specs, and it's a really good reference. Uh, Gadget is a really good reference. Uh, but yeah, it's absolutely because I love to go out there and I, you know, I love to do it, and it, it's just fun to kind of be in, in the scrum on those days. Um, yeah. But for me, mostly it's it's just Apple events. You know, I, I was covering Microsoft keynotes um, early on with Gadget, and you know, we were looking at the numbers, and it's just, you know, the interest really tends to not be there. Even with like Google I.O., um, you know, it's actually orders of magnitude less interest than an Apple keynote. Interesting. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Why, why is the world so uh, I, focused I on Apple? Uh, you know, I mean, I think the, the quality of the products is, is, you know, pretty astounding. I mean, you're not going to see Apple release uh, a Nexus Q. Um, although I guess, you know, some would say, you know, the Hi5. Remember the, the Apple yep. Hi5, for example? Maybe that was their Nexus Q. I mean, I don't but know. But it's but been I a mean, while since we've had one of those right, dogs from Apple. Yeah. They're very few and far between. And um, I think the reality is whether or not you like Apple and whether or not you would actually admit this publicly, um, given your, you know, allegiances to Windows Phone or Android or PCs or whatever, Apple sets the tone for the industry. What Apple does, um, almost everyone else tends to follow. Yeah. Um, that's not true for everything, and there's always, you know, 
the, you know, a smattering of things that other companies do first and, and Apple plays catch up later. Um, but the reality is, you know, Apple, in the macro sense, set, sets the tone for the personal technology industry. Yeah, I know when I work at Microsoft, we looked at them really, really closely. And um, I think uh, the execs sort of didn't copy them quickly enough, you know, and didn't take them seriously enough. I, I was there in 2003 and through six, and I remember Bomber going, ah, you know, that's a cute little computer company, you know, which back then Microsoft had a, a lot more market share and a lot more market dominance. Today, Apple really is past them and, and in almost every way. <laughs> I mean, stock yeah, price and absolutely. market think, share and all sorts of things. I think Apple's, uh, you know, biggest potential, uh, you know, issue that they could face in the future is just what Microsoft did. Uh, you know, in, in the mid-aughts, which is to underestimate their competition. Um, I don't think that they are there yet, but I can totally see, a, you know, uh, a, a time in the future where they've written off Microsoft completely, and I, I always think that's a really bad idea. Yeah, um, that, you know, Bomber still has $60 billion in his pocket. That, that gives yeah. you a lot of options for how, how to do things. And Microsoft has, like, a lot of, you know, really great Trojan Horse products. I mean, the Xbox 360, uh, that is such a powerful platform for them, and I think it's highly underrated. Um, you know, that's, I think, maybe uh, when we're looking at Apple's future product lines, what they're going to do with the Apple TV if they release a television set, which, as a sidebar, I don't think they will. Um, you know, the Xbox 360 is, you know, probably their main competitor right now yeah. uh, for, that, for that future direction. And no, and I just noticed they lowered the price on the Kinect to $110, which is key, because that sensor, there's entire startups that are startup incubators that are springing around just the sensor, the Kinect yeah. sensor. And it's going to get even better. I mean, when they do the Kinect 2 and when they do the next Xbox, probably, I'm going to assume next year, I think the next the next Connect, the next uh, Xbox, you know, that's going to unlock even more potential. Yeah, but it, the the world really is focused on, I think, uh, on phones and tablets right now. I, Absolutely, uh, it seems like that's what uh, what gets people up in arms and debating in bars and stuff like that. Like, oh, S three versus the iPhone five or six. You know, what what, what are we? Uh, yeah, I mean, we decide? have we have dozens of product categories. Um, you know, from everything from laptops to USB drives um, and everything in between. Cell phones by far is our biggest product category in terms of interest and usage. Yeah, and I think that makes sense because the cell phone is the, the device you're going to carry with you Yeah, all it's the most the personal time. device. Where, where do you think the future is going? Uh, do you think these Google Glasses have any shot at being becoming I, a mainstream I don't think so. Thing? I'm actually writing a piece right now um, for somebody about how I don't think that, that Google Glass is going to go anywhere. Mostly because I think um, well, it's really two things. One, I don't think that people want to wear uh, a device on their face. Um, yeah. I think that that's just too I much. I do. Some, so you do. <laughs> and that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I might. But I don't think people with a capital P want to. I don't yeah. think that the mass market would want to wear a product on their face like that. Uh, it's, it's hard enough to get people to you know, just use simple products that they can keep in their pocket. Not in, unless there is some huge utility that is easily communicatable. Like but that's, the other, that's number two. Is I don't yeah. think that there is a Google Glass. I don't think that there is an experience there that you can't get with your cell phone. And I think that the, the, the most important thing about your cell phone from like a personal interaction standpoint is that when it's out, you know, it sends a, a very clear visual signal to other people that I'm using this product and that's where my focus is. And then when it's in my pocket, it's gone, right? Yeah. It's push versus pull. So, you know, uh, push is great for email, but I want my device interactions to be pull. It's going to be interesting. I, uh, I, I disagree, but I, I, I agree but disagree. I, I think this could be like Google's Microsoft tablet PC, where it sells a million because it's geeky and it's fun and, and it does something different. But I, I agree that it, it might struggle with the mainstream audience because I, I think Google has too much cultural baggage to get you the promised land. I, I keep seeing new, new startups who are hooking to Google and Facebook, and Google engineers just seem to have a, a thing about Facebook. Yeah. I think there's a lot of the value that's going to be in a wearable computer is going to be social. It's going to be, hey, I'm, I'm looking at you, and I need to know a little bit about who you are so I know what to talk to you about. And that sounds a little freaky, but I've had so many experiences like that. I, I met this guy uh, named Peter Pyatt. He had a badge on. I knew his name. I knew his employer. He had Bill and Melinda right. Gates Foundation. And I knew he was smart because uh, everybody was talking to him and genuflecting toward him. And y you could tell by the way he talked, he was smart. 
but I couldn't figure out what, who he was, what made him interesting. I go away from him, Google him, and he discovered the Ebola virus. I wish I had known that hmm. in my glass, you know, in my glasses right there. And I don't know that Google's going to get to that place with these this first iteration. It might be five or six more years, sort of like Microsoft showed us the tablet. I got excited by it, but it, I got the same reaction that you're giving me with the glasses. Oh, that's sort of geeky. Oh, why do I? Right. Need it? So, so Microsoft showed us the tablet, but it was Apple that actually made it work, and yeah. and you know it required them coming at it from a completely different approach with completely different objectives in order to make it work. And and then Microsoft says, oh yeah, duh, of course. And, Actually, and Apple showed us a Newton, remember that? <laughs> they that did. is true, although that was different leadership. So, you know, yeah. let's, let's be fair, that, was, that wasn't Steve. Steve killed the Newton, uh, for better or worse. Uh, you know, some people would say worse, but um, you know, it might be the same thing with Google Glass. It might be that you know we have to come back to it, we have to revisit it um, a few years later once the technology has advanced sufficiently enough to you know not make it a big clunky thing. I mean, I don't know if you played with it or use it, but you know, there's like a big component that's like stuck to your head. So uh, you know, if we can get there where it's like it's literally built into these glasses, you don't see anything, and it's not like a big plate of glass in front of my face, and you know, it doesn't look like anything. Maybe then. Uh, but I think you know it's going to be a little while before we get there. You get a sense of why I like you because I, I could talk about gadgets all day long, and I, I love what you do. So Thanks. keep it up, and uh, uh, we're probably going to see you at an Apple event soon, right? Yeah, it <laughs> looks like uh, September. <laughs> we're, yeah. ho we're hoping, right? I can't, I can't wait to get a new phone. Yeah, me too. I, you know, and, and that's sort of funny that we're both waiting for Apple to bring us a new phone, even though the Samsung seems like a pretty nice phone compared comparative to the current phones. We're all yeah. in a holding pattern to see Well, you know what I actually did was. recently, and I, I wrote about it on, on Gadget in our discussion uh, area, is um, for the first time, I had never done this before, I, uh, I left my iPhone at home you know, for three weeks, uh, or like two and a half weeks, and I switched over to an Android device as my primary device. So I've, I've used many, many Android, like almost all of the Android phones or, or you know, releases over the past few years, but I'd never used it as my exclusive cell phone. I mean, that's a huge step yeah. for anyone to take. And um, I did it for a few weeks, and it was, it was good. Um, it was much, much better than it, it's ever been, uh, especially with Jelly Bean. But I just I couldn't, I couldn't make the jump. Yeah. So I went back to iPhone at, at the end. I'm the same way. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Where do we uh, read you? Where uh, do we follow gadget you? Gadget.com is a gdgt.com. I'm also uh, at Ryan on Twitter. That's a cool name. How did you get that on Twitter? Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't reveal all my secrets. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for, thanks for having me come out. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Mm -hmm.